All right, so what did James Watson and Francis Crick do? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so they structure they, they elucidated the double helix. And you can see the two children here playing with their tinker toys. Two can was literally tinker toys to elucidate the structure. They knew basically what the composition was, and they knew that the general structure for each individual nucleotide, what it looked like, and they put together the molecule in really the only plausible way that it would actually work to go together based off of data that they have. The data that they got, um, we've been able to use this technology for 100 years now called x-ray crystallography. And basically using x-rays, we're able to visualize structure of really, really small things like DNA or proteins. Um, Maurice Wilkins and one of his students at the time, Rosalind Franklin, had been perfecting the technique looking at proteins, and they applied the technique to DNA, which DNA is surprisingly easy to extract from a cell. You basically have to use a little bit of detergent, and you can use dial soap, literally, to show from the, the bottle, spray that onto a source that has some cells, adds some salt in, which helps to uh, block the DNA from interacting with the water, and then add in a little isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol that you can get at the drugstore, and bam, you got the thing. So it's really, really easy to get at. They extract the DNA, and they would pull it out in long threads, and then they would use X ray crystallography, basically bounce X rays off of the uh, molecule of DNA, let those diffract onto a sheet of um, photographic paper, and then we get an image. And based off of that image, they make a bunch of measurements on that image. Uh, they elucidated that it had to be this double helix structure following the law of complementary and basic, where we had to have, have A's and T's and G's and C's. In other words, period and epitome, three carbon rings across the molecule. So they elucidated the double helical structure, which is the three-dimensional structure of the DNA molecule. And they further elucidated that it probably had to have that phosphorus and sugar component on the outside making up a backbone. So the backbone is outside, and then the base pair is the nucleotide and trigonous base is the nitrogen-containing bases of what's on the inside. <coughs> now, the double helix formed, and it actually associates with a bunch of other proteins. So you have DNA and you have proteins and even some RNAs as well that make up the chromosome. So right now we're just simply talking about the RNA in its naked form. And that RNA in its naked form ends up being this double helix in a very long molecule. <coughs> Millions of base pairs in length. Now, the DNA, we know low already that it holds information, RNA is going to carry information into the cytosol to cell to generate genes. So if you look at the DNA, there are going to be short little segments that we call genes. So the whole molecule, there are 46 of these molecules in humans, because we have 23 pairs of DNA. The longest DNA is going to be chromosome number one, and that's on the order of a couple million base pairs. Overall, if you look at all of the DNA molecules, all 46 of them collectively, there are 3.5 billion nucleotides in humans. 
And within those 3.5 billion nucleotides, there are segments all along those, uh, those DNA molecules that represent genes. Now, why is it double-stranded? Well, the strands are actually complementary to each other. And that complementarity becomes a very useful tool in biology and in chemistry. So we know that A's and T's, T's and A's, B's and C's, and C's and G's all go together. Two hydrogen bonds between the A's and the T's, three hydrogen bonds between the G's and C's, and the molecules run complementary to each other. In other words, I can find an A here, and I know that I have to have a T on the other strand. So if you know one sequence of DNA, you can deduce the other. So if you know one sequence, you can deduce the other sequence because of that complementary structure. As we just finish up here with our macro, macro molecules, rather, the last macromolecule, also a nucleotide, is going to be RNA. RNA is single strand, and it carries the information. DNA holds the information. RNA is going to carry the information. The RNA's information is extracted from the DNA. And in one of the strands, we actually can swap all of the T's for U's, uracil, and we can end up <coughs> with the correct RNA sequence. It's going to be single stranded. And by the way, that single strand of DNA, I'm sorry, RNA rather, is going to be able to fold up into different structures, hairpin structures and things like that. So basically fold back on itself. Um, so in some cases, it actually can have the appearance that it's double stranded. If the molecule folds back on itself, you have sections of it that bind up to your hydrogen bonds. Um, that's, that's actually very possible. So if I give you a DNA code, A, G, T, T, G, and I ask you to deduce the RNA code based off of our simple T to U translation, the RNA code is going to just simply be A, G, U, U, G. As long as I'm giving you what is known as the antisense or the non-template strength. And we're going to go more detail into the interaction between RNA and DNA when we get to molecular biology and cluster Yeah. So this is the DNA, and then this guy right there. Okay. So everything that we've talked about up to this point has been leading us to produce a cell. We now have all of the components that we need to begin to form organelle that can be put together to form a cell. So let's start with a new lecture. If you want to call it something, call it the cell. And I want to begin with Robert Koch, 1665. 
So Robert Hooke, 1665, one of the early users of the microscope, you may recognize the name Anton von Leeuwenhoek as one of the other um, initial discoverers and users of microscopes. 1665, Robert Hooke is a, observing a pond scum through a microscope. And he sees small, little, moving creatures. <coughs> ended up in single cell organisms, things like primates uh, and flagellates and things like that. So we've got these individual little tiny organisms that are swimming around in this suit. And he begins to look at some other things. Um, eventually, he's beginning to look at cell samples from humans. And he's beginning to notice similarities, and he's beginning to notice differences. And pretty soon, we could find two types <coughs> of cells. And you already are familiar with these types of cells. We've already talked through them briefly. We'll talk through them in a little more detail now. Eukaryotic, what does that mean? I didn't remember the Latin. True, true, true kernel. So EU is the true, and then karyo is the kernel, referring to a kernel of corn, because the nucleus was very prominent in these eukaryotic cells and looked like a kernel of corn sitting in the middle. We now understand today and recognize that eukaryotic cells show up in plants, in protists, in fungi and in animals, including humans. And it wasn't just that there was a nucleus. We now understand that all of the organelles were bound. And an organelle basically is this little part of the cell that does something. The nucleus holds the genetic information. The mitochondria produce energy in the form of ATP. The Golgi complex packages up proteins and materials to be delivered out of the cell. The uh, endoplasmic reticulum helps to deal with protein production and lipid modification. Um, so we have all of these different areas in the cell that are all bound up and separated from each other that are doing specific tasks within the cell. So it's not just that the nucleus is there that contains the DNA, but there are other bound organelles as well. Now we also began to notice that there was a type of cell that did not have a kernel, and it was referred to as the prokaryotic cell, which means it is before the kernel. And we find this in bacteria, which is one of the most prominent organisms on the planet. <coughs> Another group of uh, a little less known called archaea. Now, even though there are no bone organelle, there are still going to be regions where these metabolic activities occur to generate things like ATP to hold the genetics of creatures to produce proteins. So it's not that they're happening within a membrane-bound organelle, they're happening within specific regions. So rather than having a nucleus, we have a nucleoid, which is where all the DNA is sort of contained and packaged together. It's just not wrapped up in a lipid bile. So Robert Hooke begins to define these first two types of cells, and we begin to see similarities and differences. The step that we go to next is to begin to define cells based off of their size. Now, when it comes to studying cell physiology, it sure would be nice if I could just look at a cell and I could see all the processes that are occurring. But cells are really, really small. The largest cell is the ovum in mammals, which is going to be the female sex gamete. And if you want to get a reference for the size of that particular cell, it's pretty much the equivalent to the size of a period of application in standard textbook which is still really, really small. You probably can see it with the naked eye if you knew where you were looking. But really, beyond just seeing the dot, you're not going to see any of the physiology that's occurring within the cell. So why are cells so small? 
And the answer is because there are natural biological limits. And what you're going to find out is there's actually a small limit as well. There's an upper limit and there is a lower limit. And I'm going to actually start with the lower limit. So the smallest cells that we have are on the order of 0.1 to 1 micrometer in diameter. So just to give you a little bit of a reference here, meter and then a thousand times smaller than that is a millimeter and a thousand times smaller than that is a micrometer. So we're talking about a million times smaller than a meter, which is really pretty small. <coughs> Why do we have this lower limit? Why can't we go below 0.1 micrometers in diameter? It's all about room. As we decrease the size of the molecule, we're going to decrease, I'm sorry, the size of the cell, we're going to decrease that cell's volume, right? So if I take Olivia's iterate frost, glacial cherry, and I were to put it into, try to put it into one cup, I'm probably going to overflow, right? So there's too much material here for one cup because this is 20 fluid ounces, so it's like two and a half cups. So there's far too much material. So as I decrease the volume, I have to decrease the amount of stuff that's present. What if the amount of stuff that I'm decreasing is the DNA? And the DNA is what holds the information to produce proteins. And those proteins are critical for physiology and for sustaining life. So as I decrease the volume of the cell, invariably I'm decreasing the cell's DNA capacity. There's going to be too much material that's required to sustain life as we go smaller and smaller and smaller. And when we tend to get below 0.1 micrometers, the DNA has to be manipulated so much that we begin to lose vital proteins for successful life. So as DNA capacity has to decrease to fit into a smaller and smaller back, uh, packet or volume, <coughs> the number of genes that that DNA can hold has to be reduced. And if those genes are for important metabolic processes, eventually we're going to get to a point where we've lost enough genes, we've manipulated enough of the metabolic processes that certain processes that are needed are just simply going to be lost. So what if I get rid of proteins that help remove waste? Pretty soon I can no longer handle waste. Waste is going to accumulate. Accumulation of waste in a biological system is extremely problematic. Life will not continue. Or if it's energy production, the fate begins to be the same. Okay, so the lowest limit, we're not going to really probably ever go or discover cells that are below about a tenth of a micrometer in length, just because there's not going to be enough room for the genetic material to produce adequate numbers of proteins for the metabolic processes that are required. The smallest known cell right now is an uh, organism known as Nanoarchaea equantis, and it has a genome of 500,000 base pairs, just under 500,000 base pairs. It's right at 0.1 micrometers in length. This is considered to be probably the smallest known living cell that we'll ever discover because as we go below that, we're going to begin to lose important genetic life giving proteins. So, what's the upper limit? And we've already identified that it's the mammalian ovum, the female sex gamete. And that's roughly 100 micrometers in diameter. Large enough to see with the naked eye, not large enough to see any sort of physiological feature. 
So why can't we have cells that are any bigger than that? The issue that we run into is related to the volume, surface, area, ratio. Okay, so volume and surface area. I want you to begin to think ahead here a little bit. How do I measure both of those quantities? How do I quantify volume and how do I quantify surface area? Mathematically. Not rhetorical. The actual question I'm asking you. How do I quantify it? Okay. Okay, cubes and squares. I'm going to use for volume, my height, my width, and my depth. And I'm going to use, or my length rather, and then for my surface area, I'm going to use my, <coughs> my, and my length. So I'm going to use two factors for surface area, three factors for volume. Okay, so keep that in mind, and we're going to go through a little bit of math. And I'm going to relate this to one of the dimensions. I'm just going to call one dimension diameter, which is <coughs> sort of reference block-shaped molecules in our cells here. The diameter is no longer really the diameter. It's just the width of the, of the cell. All right? So as I increase the diameter, my volume responds x to the third increase in volume, whereas my surface area is x squared. So if I come over here, this is a one by one by one millimeter. You can see that the surface area is six millimeters squared. The volume is one millimeter squared. If I take that ratio of volume to surface area, it's going to be for this first example, one over six. Okay? Now I just simply double, go from one to two millimeters. My surface area is now 24, my volume is now eight. So 8 over 24, and if you do the math there, you can see that my changes here from 1 to 8 is a factor of 8. So we keep on going in that thread, x squared and x to the third volume is getting bigger. The surface area doesn't get as big as quickly, and the ratio leads to a point where we have a much higher volume than the surface area. So what does the volume actually relate to in terms of the cell? I'm sorry, what was that? I saw the Okay, how much the cell can hold? How about it relates to its metabolic demand? How much energy is required to sustain? So this volume is related to its metabolic demand. The more volume that I have, the more energy that I need, the more nutrients that I'm going to require, the more oxygen that I'm going to demand. So there's this huge metabolic demand inside of the cell as we increase volume. What about the surface area? What does the surface area relate to? It's on the outside of the cell. It's the surface of the cell. It's the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is where everything is being moved into and out of the cell. So if I need glucose to produce ATP, if I need glucose to meet that metabolic demand, I got to pull it across my cell membrane. 
the lower the surface area becomes in relationship to the metabolic demand, the less efficiently I can supply energy and waste fuel for that metabolic demand. So that surface area is what it relates to the cell membrane, and it's what traffics wastes and metabolites in and out of the cell. So it's related to the membrane. The volume is related to the cytoplasm. All of the stuff that's inside the cell that has to be maintained. I need energy to maintain my Golgi complex. I need energy to maintain my mitochondria and my endoplasmic reticulum, my vacuoles, and everything that's inside of the cell. That energy is coming from sources that are outside of the cell. I'm not producing the energy from anything in the cell. I'm using stuff from outside the cell, such as glucose. So as metabolic activity and demand increase due to increases in volume, surface area would also have to expand. But because surface area only expands by x to the 2, if I go back to our example here, our numbers, so up here, we got a 1 to 6. The top factor is my volume. Volume increases by a factor of 8. Where with the increase in diameter, we're now only here on the bottom increasing by a factor of um, 3, 4, 4. Okay, and then I do it again up to here to, let's go just another uh, <coughs> from 2 to 3. So we'll go right in between there. And then the uh, three, the three to the three is going to be twenty-seven. Three squared is going to be nine. I did that right. I got my volume in my surface area. That's what the volume is. So one to six. This is my volume. And this is my surface area. And so volume here on my 2 by 2 by 2 example is 8. Surface area is 24. Volume and surface area. If we go up to a diameter of 3, 27. And then my 3 squared is 9. And you can see that we've totally outrun. Oh, it's not nine. No, I'm sorry. It's going to be uh, three, three, nine times the six surfaces, 50, 54. I was just doing x squared and like 54. And as you go through and measure these, you can see that volume is increasing by a much higher factor, from one to eight. 8 to 27 is a factor of about uh, 3, just over 3. The surface area is a much lower factor, more closer to 'll actually look like uh, and I'm going to take the cell anatomy structure I'm going to take this from a eukaryotic perspective and really I'm going to be looking at plants and animal cells and I'm going to try to stare at it we're not going to really deal with fungi and protists at this point so if we do the magic school bus thing, enter into the cell, and you will come into this solution called cytosol. And everything else is going to be 
uh, in, in, in uh, incorporated into that cytosol collectively. The cytosol and everything else is referred to as the cytoplasm. So the term cytoplasm is going to be the fluid inside of the cell plus the organelle in the cell. The fluid is just simply going to be referred to as the cytosol. So just the fluid. So everything is the cytoplasm. Just the fluid, which is what they're showing here, is it's only the fluid. None of the organelles will be the cytosol. So it's erroneous to put the two together as, as if they are interchangeable. The cytosol is not the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm contains the cytosol. The cytosol is just referencing only that fluid component. Good. <coughs> Bound around the cytoplasm is going to be our cell membrane. And specifically, the cell membrane is a type of plasma membrane. Plasma membranes are not necessarily just cell membranes. The cell membrane is a type of plasma membrane, just like the mitochondrial membranes are, a, are plasma membranes. The Golgi complex has a plasma membrane. The endoplasm in particular has a plasma membrane. So, is the plasma membrane under the cytoplasm, or is that another? Or are we writing that underneath the cytoplasm? Or? A cytoplasm, fluid, and organelle, cell, B cytosol, C plasma number. Now, biological membranes, plasma membranes, they have to be selectively permeable lipid bilayers, or all of them are selectively permeable lipid bilayers. So selectively permeable lipid bilayers. What exactly does that mean? That's a loaded question. It's a loaded definition. Starting with selectively, what does it mean? Okay, so only certain things at certain times. If the cell needs glucose, it's going to allow glucose to cross. If it needs sodium, it's going to allow sodium to cross. If it doesn't need sodium, it's probably not going to allow sodium to cross. How does selectively differentiate from semi perfect? Saran wrap is semi-permeable. Diffusion, uh, the diffusion lab that you did with the um, dialysis tubing, that was a semi-permeable membrane. Some things pass and some things can't, but they can't control where. Okay, so it's not selective for one. And usually what is it based off of? Size. Some sort of characteristic, a lot of times it's size. It could be charged, though. But yeah, semi-permeable membrane, which we do not find in biological systems. A semi-permeable decides, based off of some characteristic, what's going to cross. And so if the cell doesn't need glucose, it is semi it, it, but it's semi-permeable and it would allow glucose to cross, the process is just going to cross. I'm talking about per, uh, semi-permeable now. Uh, selectively permeable is going to, like this door is semi permeable, right? If we had a big enough dude in here, that dude would not be able to get out of the room. Or get into the room. He would be, based off of size, not permeable to the wall. All of us are permeable to the wall because we're small enough to be able to get through that door. Whereas a selectively permeable membrane, that door would only allow, I don't know, girls if it was a selectively permeable membrane, but only when it needed more girls inside of it. 
It's a terrible example. So it selects based off of its need and not just simply because it allows certain size or charged molecules to come inside. Permeable just simply means things get cross, right? It's permeable to stuff moving across. And then lipid bilayer. Lipid is now you know the type of macromolecule. What's unique about lipids? Awesome. Okay, so fatty acids are a type of lipid, but what's unique about the lipid itself? And what are unique about those long chains we're getting there now? Okay, we can have polar and nonpolar regions. Those long chains are tails. They are hydrocarbons and they are hydrophobic. So they don't play well with water. So lipids become really good at creating these barriers because they energetically have a chemical makeup that favors the inward reflection of the lipid tail, the hydrophobic tails, to end up stuck inside of the membrane, away from the watery environment. And so then that's what helps us to develop bilayer. So if I were to take some lipids and I were just to toss them into water, and they were in that hydrophobic tail, hydrophilic head orientation because of the uh, third part of the glycerol molecule having that phosphate group, what they're going to do is they are going to rotate and orient in such a way that all of the hydrophobic tails end up facing each other, and the hydrophilic heads face the water environment. And we can create a really nice barrier. So plasma membrane again, selectively permeable lipid bilayer, and they're going to show up in a variety of places. So it's not necessarily just around the cell, which I have heard people before refer to the cell membrane as the plasma membrane, and really that's not accurate. The cell membrane is the cell membrane, and it is a type of uh, it is a type of plasma membrane. And so the cell membrane is around the cell, but we're also going to find plasma membranes to help compartmentalize our organelle in the eukaryotic cells. So we compartmentalize our organelle here as well. Now, the membrane, and you can sort of see that highlighted here, the membrane is not necessarily just going to be lipids. You can see that we have lipids and then a bunch of other stuff. We have proteins that are incorporated within the membrane or that are on the surface. And we even have sugar moieties that get attached to both the lipids and the proteins that exist. So the plasma membrane is going to consist not only of lipids but also proteins and carbohydrates or saccharides to produce this very unique plasma membrane structure. When you get into cell biology, you'll talk a lot about the plasma membrane and the different components, and how we actually are able to peel the membrane apart with its two leaflets. Uh, and we can look at what's going on inside of the membrane and outside of the membrane. The lipids, by the way, they can be phospholipids, but a whole bunch of different types of lipids as well. There's also sphingolipids and, and other types of lipids that can be incorporated. Cholesterol would be another type of lipid that gets incorporated into, into the plasma membranes as well. All right, just to start out with some organelles. The nucleus, obviously, this is going to be our most prominent organelle within the cell. Uh, it is what actually houses 
our genetic material. Now, the plasma membrane that we find in the nucleus is really pretty unique. So you can see that we've taken and we've highlighted the plasma membrane of the nucleus here. It's actually called a nuclear envelope. And the nuclear envelope, you can see that the membrane actually folds back on itself. And so it forms what appears to be two separate layers. Both of them are lipid fibers. It just it forms this double layer plasma membrane. Each layer is then its own phospholipid bilayer. And so we call it a nuclear envelope rather than just simply a membrane because of this unique structure. Incorporated within that nuclear envelope are going to be these larger protein uh, holes or pores called nuclear pores that help with the transport of messenger RNA and other molecules into and out of the <coughs> nucleus. So those pores are going to help out with macromolecule flow and macromolecule movement. Inside of the nucleus, we have the DNA. Uh, in a non-dividing cell, the <coughs> DNA is in a very diffuse structure called the chromatin network. The chromatin network. And so it looks more like a plate of spaghetti than what you would classically probably draw as a chromosome, which would be more of an X-shaped structure, which is really what we see during uh, mitosis, during nuclear division. <clears throat> By the way, the nucleolus inside of the cell this is the birthplace of ribosomes. This is where the protein producing the structure of the ribosome is going to be generated. Um, do not confuse these individual phospholipid bilayers as being a on its own phospholipid bilayer. So you have two different layers of the uh, nuclear envelope, and then each layer, I just want to reiterate this, is the is an individual phospholipid bilayer. So if you were to draw a small section of the nuclear envelope, there's the heads and the tails. This would just be one side, then we'd have the space. And the other portion of the envelope is also a lipid bilayer. The solution inside of the nucleus is called the nucleosol. We also could have the nucleoplasm, simply referring to sol as in the solution, and then the nucleoplasm, the solution plus the things like the genetic material, the chromosomes, and the nucleolus, etc. The next organelle that you'll find in the cell is actually a huge protein complex. <clears throat> it's called the ribosome, or the ribosomes. And ribosomes are heavily involved in the protein synthesis process. So it is the protein synthesis organelle. And you can see that we're able to read the messenger RNA. We're able to put in the right amino acid to grow and produce a peptide that eventually can become or incorporated, become incorporated into a protein. 
Again, they're being produced in the nucleus in the nucleolus, and they are transported from the nucleolus, leave via the nuclear pore, and enter into the cytosol. And once in the cytosol, they're going to be found in two locations. They're going to be found just floating around free in the cytosol, just as an individual ribosome, or what we would refer to as the free ribosome. Or, or we'll find that ribosomes associated with the endoplasmic reticulum. When they are on the endoplasmic reticulum, like you can see here in this figure, it gives the endoplasmic reticulum a very rough or bumpy appearance. And so we refer to that portion of the endoplasmic reticulum as being the rough ER. So the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER, is going to be our next organelle. You can see that it, it closely interfaces with the nuclear envelope, and there are even these bridges that lead from that nuclear intramembrane space into some of the cisternae, or portions of the endoplasmic reticulum. You will also notice that the endoplasmic reticulum has either a rough appearance or a smooth appearance. This is the rough ER, and this is going to be the smooth ER. Rough ER is typically associated with new or nascent protein production. So the endoplasmic reticulum becomes a network within the cytosol. The smooth ER, which is going to be no ribosomes present, and the rough ER, which has ribosomes, <coughs> make up the subdivisions. So you have the rough and we have the smooth. Now, notice that we do have, it looks very similar to the nuclear envelope. And really what you're looking at is you have individual compartments. And again, it's a plasma membrane, so we're looking at a selectively permeable lipid bile. And those compartments are a membrane with an internal space, the open space, is going to be referred to as a cistern, cistern A. Cistern, uh, this is like a base or a, or a pot. And so we're calling these individual cistern, we're calling those like a cistern or a cistern A. The last final thing I have for you today as you're packing up. Inside of the cistern, you have the cisternal space. And those spaces occasionally are going to be, as we see here, attached to the nuclear space. So attached to the nuclear envelope. So we'll pick up there on Wednesday.